So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Landscape Summit. I'm Michael Dukes, the Director of the Center for Land Use Efficiency. Um, I will introduce our panel and speakers here in a minute. Uh, I posted in the chat, if you're joining the room, the, a link to a blog post that lists the, uh, the summit over time. We're gonna be doing this every Wednesday at 1 p.m. through the end of March. Uh, so you can see what, what all is there. And also a link to the registration is there as well. Uh, our goal here is to provide, continue to provide education on the latest science related to the green industry. And uh, we're actually brainstorming. We may have a bonus event at the very end of the summit, but we'll, I'll talk about that later. Also, each summit will have a blog post and the summit is being recorded and we will post that on the web. More on that as we get things posted. All right, so first I'd like to uh, start off by welcoming our new Vice President of Agriculture and Natural Resources, Dr. Scott Angle. Uh, I've got a little brief intro about him. Um, Dr. Angle was apparently supposed to be a golf pro um, I didn't know that actually. And he aspired to, to be that. And then at some point he figured out that wasn't gonna be the path forward. So uh, he was supposed to be a golf course superintendent where that led him to um, a scholarship at Maryland uh, by the Golf Course Superintendent Association to study turf science. And ultimately he became a, a faculty member uh, and studied phytoremediation at the University of Maryland as a way to clean the Chesapeake Bay. So. He's very versed in uh, soils, the natural environment, and also water quality issues. So uh, that ultimately led him here uh, by way of increased res administrative responsibility at Maryland, and then the Dean of College of Agricultural Environmental and Environmental Sciences at UGA. He also served as a CEO of the International Fertilizer Development Center, uh, where he traveled the world and saw the, the effects of fertilizer bringing people out of poverty and feeding people. More recently, he became uh, the director of the USDA NEFA in 2018. And then finally, he just recently joined us at the University of Florida in IFAS. Um, he, be he became our, our leader in July and he's launched a number of initiatives, including expansion of hands-on learning, artificial intelligence uh, into our research, teaching and extension, and infusing IFAS with a diversity of people uh, that uh, makes scientific advance successful. So uh, he joins us today to kick off the summit. Thanks, Dr. Angle, for taking the time to be here today. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks for that nice introduction. And I also want to congratulate you for all the great work you have done. I think the state is better off because of your work and the center that you um, have led and the, the work that it does. Uh, one of my initial observations about Florida is that it is just so complicated. I worked in Georgia for a decade in agriculture and the environment. I, th probably, I thought I had a pretty good sense of what Florida would be like. And I guess I do, I understand the panhandle, but there is a little more beyond the panhandle and um, you know, in some ways it's a huge challenge because of the diversity of the state. And in other ways, it's really made it a lot of fun and a pleasure to be a part of uh, because those challenges are also opportunities. But when you look at the diversity of people, of businesses, of employment, of soils, of climate, of crops, of, of needs, um, it's just, it's almost overwhelming. And there are a lot of very specific issues that we get into BMPs, nutrient management would be a good example, where when you start thinking about where do we apply nutrients, where do we irrigate, how do we look at those inputs, and then all the different systems that they are applied to, it becomes a, a real challenge to make sure that we are providing the right recommendations for the, uh, the right location. Uh, obviously, again, Florida has a strong industry in, in traditional agriculture, fruits and vegetables particularly, uh, forestry, natural resources, fisheries. But one of the reasons why I'm so pleased with, uh, with the center is that the, the, the industry that supports our urban and suburban friends 
is uh, just as important. And particularly when you look at the number of people on the land mass, it's, it's really quite phenomenal how much impact that has on our environment. And also knowing that we have lots of, of um, indeed um, significant problems in the state related to our environment, water being the main one, but that's not the only ones, soil pollution, climate change, many others. Uh, but when you look at water and how that interacts with the managed landscape and also the natural landscape, agriculture and forestry, um, these are things that we have to be successful in. So I really enjoyed getting to know more about kind of those suburban urban needs. How do, how do homeowners, how do businesses maintain their land in a way that also protects uh, our environment and achieves the goals of what the state wants. The state wants it all. Uh, it's quite clear that they want agriculture to remain successful, it's forestry, fisheries, um, minimal impact on the environment. They want homeowners to have options for management. So do they want a very, very Florida friendly landscape or do they want something more traditional that requires more inputs, but using our best technologies to minimize those inputs. So that's where the center comes in. Uh, and it's all the way from that, what I would call a traditional landscape, but maybe managed differently to, um, I know what my wife wants is uh, you know, a very, very Florida friendly landscape. We've just moved into town. We live in the Duck Pond area of, of Gainesville. And she is, as we speak, probably ripping out all the azaleas and putting in plants that not having come from Florida, I have no idea what most of them are, but they, she tells me that they, um, they use a whole lot less water and fertilizer. So, and everything in between there. Um, as IFAS, we have a responsibility to all citizens of the state. People traditionally think about IFAS and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences as being that traditional supporter of um, fruits and vegetables and, and the panhandle cotton and peanuts and, and forests and um, those managed natural resources along the coastal areas. But we have responsibility for the entire state. And um, that's as a result of that, because this center is where really the heart of that support comes from. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're pleased to see what it does, but Michael, I wanna make sure you and your coworkers know that we, um, I'm particularly committed to your success of the center because ultimately that is the success of the state. We have problems that we have to address. And if we don't, um, there's gonna be ramifications I think all of us will be unhappy with. So this is not one of those issues where we can do our best and if it works and you know, great, if it doesn't work, well, so what? Uh, this, this is, I guess, one of those areas where failure is literally not an option. Um, some amazing staff, uh, some amazing expertise. I'm glad that all of you are here to, to uh, be with uh, us today. I'm certainly gonna be coming back to a lot of these because as I've looked over the agenda, there's a lot I wanna see and learn about as well, um, particularly being a, a newcomer uh, to the state. So let me just close out by saying we have our challenges. Uh, we've got to find ways to um, give homeowners the options that they want, but done in a more sustainable way than they have in the past. We've got to make sure that we support our traditional agricultural and forestry enterprises as well. And ultimately, we got to find a way for everyone to get along. Uh, I've been in lots and lots of meetings where it's always finger pointing. The homeowners are pointing their fingers at traditional ag. And when I go to a traditional ag meeting, it's say, well, it's not us, it's the lawns and the landscapes and maybe the failing septic tanks that are really the problem. I think we all understand that it's a little bit of everyone. And as a result, everyone has a responsibility and, and the center is really a place for the information to bring us together can be found. So I, I see this as a, <clears throat> as a, as a, uh, a center and through these workshops, a place to bring Florida together to talk about some pretty hard problems. These are, water quality is not a, insignificant problem. It's something that we have to do better at. But if we, you know, if we continue to fight and point fingers at each other, it's just going to delay 
the time do we get to the place where we want to be. So again, uh, thank you to Michael and staff and the center for all you do. Thank you uh, to all of you on, on a Zoom call today to want to learn more about the issues that will be discussed. And I look forward to being part of this. Thank you, Michael. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Angle, for that intro. And uh, that tees up the situation very nicely with our uh, esteemed panel of industry folks here. I say industry broadly. We have uh, three folks in the, that are leaders in the green industry, and then we have uh, a utility leader here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce each one of those, and then, uh, then we will go back to um, them one by one, and they'll have a few words of their perspective. But just to kind of lay the groundwork of what we're going, what we're, what I hope we talk about is, you know, it's essentially how are things in your world from an industry standpoint. Um, you know, I think back in, in doing some preparation for this uh, initial summit kickoff session. Um, you know, where were we at February of 2020? And I, I say that as February 2020 BC before COVID. You know, it was a, a different world. I mean, just dramatically, who could have predicted we would be where we're at? Um, we were just coming off of uh, lots of algal problems within the year to 18 months before that. And so there was a lot of talk about that. We had a relatively new administration in Florida who was um, pushing legislation for uh, different water quality concerns. And so we had a, a lot of discussion here at, at UF on the, blue, we had a blue green algae task force and there was even task forces at the, uh, that the governor uh, impaneled. So there's a lot of talk about that. And then all of a sudden COVID happened and those things, they might've gone uh, lower on the priority list, but they, they certainly didn't go away. And it's my belief those things will, will come back uh, very strongly. So with that in context, uh, let me introduce our panel. And uh, thank you uh, panelists and thank you, Dr. Angle for being here today. We have uh, Emily Eubanks who's running the show in the background on the technology that helps keep us all together here. So as I said, all questions will be in the chat and I will MC those with the panelists as we go through this. But first we have Philip Heise, who's the Director of Landscape Operations at On Top of the World Communities. He's also an FNGLA board member. Uh, ben Belusky, I invited him to be here at this kickoff panel, the CEO of FNGLA, but he had TPIE and that was a couple months ago when TPIE was planned as, that's the Tropical Plant Innovation Expo, Expo or something like that. Anyway, it's a big, big event for FNGLA. They didn't know whether it was gonna be, they were planning in person. In the end, it became virtual, but Ben will see us here. Uh, he will be at our last panel and I'm sure he'll tune in from time to time. In any case, as I said, Philip is also an FNGLA board member. Um, it, with his leadership, he's been a great partner for some of our faculty who work on uh, soil amendments and different landscape practices at On Top of the World community. So they're really doing some cutting edge stuff that uh, I believe he will talk about in his address. We've also got Richard Hudak, who is the Director of Quality Assurance with Lennar Homes, uh, Tampa Division. Uh, I've known Rick for a long time in, in collaboration with Extension in Southwest Florida. We had an Extension agent who connected us, Chris Dewey, who sadly passed away uh, last year, or I guess, uh, yeah, last year. But anyway, that was a very close relationship with uh, County Extension and actually implementing uh, some of the research that we did over the years. So he's going to talk about that. We've got Adam Jones, who is a Vice President and Director of Quality Assurance for Massey Services. Adam has been a leader for many years in the water management area um, and I think is a real pioneer in that area in the, in the industry. Uh, in addition, the Massey Services offers a full suite of landscape maintenance and pest control uh, services. And uh, they've, they've really worked a lot under, under Adam's leadership in ir really understanding irrigation efficiency. That term is talked about a lot, but I, I don't think a lot of people really understand it and implement it in their business. So he will talk about that. And then we also have uh, Michael Sweeney, who's the Deputy Executive Director of the Toho Water Authority. Uh, again, I've known Mike a long time, as many of you have. Um, Toho Water Authority has 100,000 water, wastewater customers in Osceola County. Well, Osceola County is already in a water constrained area. And it's really in the heart of where um, it's projected that a lot of population growth is gonna occur in the next 20 to 30 years. So um, Mike's got 
a lot he could talk about from that perspective. So uh, welcome to the panelists and uh, we'll just kick it off with uh, Philip, if you wanna say a few words about your world. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Dukes for having me and uh, uh, thank you for everybody that's, that's uh, on uh, the, the Zoom call or Zoom meeting. Uh, Zoom seems to be our, our latest way of, of doing things now. But um, talking about a little bit of how COVID's impacted us uh, from a, an industry standpoint, I, I can remember we had a, a Zoom meeting for our irrigation committee for the FNGLA uh, right around March, April timeframe. And, and at that point we were having to transport 70 people to the field to work uh, in a 15 passenger bus, two to three at a time. Uh, now that things have opened back up, you know, we've certainly been able to, you know, with masks and uh, social distancing, we certainly can, can keep our, our people safe uh, as we get out to the field to work. But that's uh, unfortunately something I think we're going to continue to see as a, I, I think on the news I heard last night that uh, South Africa's got another variant strain that's, that's coming out. So uh, as well as the, the, the strain out of England. Um, but the, the influx in population from the state of Florida aspect uh, due to COVID, you know, initially we saw uh, a slight dip right there around March, April, but it's picked back up. Uh, we're on track, you know, to, to meet all of our, our housing numbers this year. So I don't think we're gonna see uh, anything immediate from the, uh, the COVID impacts. You know, there's, there's certainly some concerns with with the economy now and and how that will impact our our development cycle, uh, but as of right now, last month we sold 56 homes, I think, and uh, this month we're at, uh, to date yesterday we were at 34 home sales. So we're still moving along uh, at a pretty rapid pace with our, our sales. Um, the the population as far as what's coming into the state of Florida, uh, we're still seeing you know. From, from my perspective, uh, with the landscape installs, we're, we're still moving, moving forward with nothing, no changes. Uh, every, all the development's still, still moving forward. Um, it, it is a little bit concerning uh, that we're not any further ahead with some of our irrigation design standards, uh, that we have this many people moving into the state, and yet irrigation seems to be, uh, the, the efficiency side of irrigation seems to be the, the, the missing link in, in landscape and, and development. You know, the the water authorities uh, certainly have their pulse on on how much water developers use or homeowners use and that kind of thing. But how do we get the professional side of the the industry uh, to where everybody can be under a same uh, umbrella of, of professionalism is, is a concern. Um, you know, here at on top of the world, you know, we we try our best to do. Uh, to be the stewards of, of water, of course, you know, we follow the Water Star program. As you mentioned, we have uh, partnered with the University of Florida with the compost project. And uh, we now apply compost to every yard that we install uh, prior to the home uh, being closed by the, uh, with the owner. Uh, and we found that we can grow yards in, in about 30 days with that, that application. So that reduces our, our need for water from what the water management district gives us with a 60 day grow in, now we can do it in 30 days. So that's certainly a, an asset there to us. But we, we also uh, implemented back in 2017 using the HydroWise irrigation controller, which has proven to be quite a, an effective tool in irrigation efficiency. It, it ties in with local weather stations and, and you can even use a virtual weather station, if you will, uh, to, to ratchet your water usage down uh, especially times like this where, where temperatures are, are uh, uh, we don't need to water as much. Um, but one of the other things that we're also working on is the uh, meeting some requirements through the water management district and, and assisting our water purveyor, Bay Laurel Center CDD, uh, by designing our landscapes for new homes to meet 150 gallons per capita. So, you know, when, when you look at the demographic we have of of how many people per household, you know, we're allowed 2.01 people per house. So when you do the mathematics on that, that gives you about 9,000 gallons a month to use. And uh, you know, when, when you, you back that into a landscape irrigation setting and you deduct the indoor usage, uh, that gives you about 6,000 gallons of water to irrigate a, a quarter acre lot with. So it gets challenging. 
and uh, we we've managed to to do that with um, drip irrigation and Bahia backyards, and it seems to be working well with our homeowners. But as we continue to grow in this state, we're going to have to get more inventive on how we irrigate yards, uh, get more efficient. Um, conservation is certainly a, a key too, but there's a difference between conservation and efficiency. As you, Dr. Dukes, have, have pointed out, there's a lot of confusion in the industry about what the difference is between those two things. So as a state, we've got to do more. We've got to be uh, more proactive. Uh, the Water 2070 report certainly painted a, a pretty bleak picture for, for water use across the state, and it, it pointed out landscapes as the main use or waster of water. So we've got to get better with that. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn it back over to you. Great, thanks. Um, we've got a couple comments and questions. I think we'll just handle those right now if they're for you specifically. And um, so the first one was if you could touch on the minimum wage increase. And uh, so I guess what happened is at, at, in this past election, it was, it was um, I don't know, voted that we were gonna have, uh, it was, a, you know, it won, the, the minimum wage increase won. So 15 bucks an hour and it's, it's um, cycled in over a period of five years or something like that. Is that yeah, right? By 2026, we'll have to be up to $15 an hour. So. Um, we, we have to be competitive in this market here in Marion County. Uh, we have the World Equestrian Center right down the road. And uh, when they moved in, they, they certainly uh, uh, provided a, a, a stepping point for us to, to look to what we could pay our employees. Uh, so we're, we're already above the, the minimum wage level now. Um, and, you know, that's certainly going to have impacts as we get into 2027, probably, or 2024, 2025. Um, when we start, you know, that those minimum wage levels start bumping up against what the, the state is requiring. Um, I, you know, I, I can only say thing, everything's going to cost more. You know, there's, there's a, uh, you know, I'm not going to get politically charged on this, but, you know, we can all do the mathematics. We're all smart individuals to see that, you know, everything is going to go up in cost with this. And, um, so it's it may sound good on the the outside, but at the end of the day, it's it's only going to cost you more for that hamburger, that gallon of milk. Yep, uh, unintended consequences that I don't I don't yeah. think we'll know how it'll pan out yet. All right, another question for you. Um, you mentioned about that you can grow the landscape in thirty days, cutting the sixty day establishment period in half. And uh, Rick's going to touch on some of this establishment stuff in a, in a little bit. Uh, does the short end time require an increase in irrigation rates? So in other words, did you, did you double the irrigation rates or are you actually using 50% uh, less water or some level less water? So, so when we program our clocks, we're actually programming them at 100% uh, runtime and then allowing the, the virtual solar sink is what it's called with the hydrowides. It's basically an ET based or evapotranspiration based system. So it'll adjust your run times every day based off of solar radiation and temperature. Um, so to answer that question, we will, you know, a drip irrigation system, we would water uh, 30 minutes, uh, 45 minutes on the drip irrigation, and then uh, MP rotators irrigate the grass. So those are set to water at a 90 minute run time to give you 0.63 inches of water. So we'll use that and then allow that, that solar sink to adjust it down. It may water a full 90 minutes in the middle of summer, or maybe now it's maybe watering 60 minutes. So it all depends, but we're, we're watering that every, every day for 30 days and then we back it down. Okay, um, one other question came in. Are you notifying your customers about raising prices due to the minimum wage increases or will those just get rolled in as cost, cost of living increases over time? So that, that's kind of a tricky question. Um, with, with on top of the world, we have uh, two different uh, management or maintenance schemes. We have a, an internal maintenance company that maintains homes for the residents and they pay a, a monthly community assessment fee. So we set that budget every year for those homeowners and that will be based off of the, the minimum wage increases. So there will be increases to that on another side of the company that I also manage, we, we have a maintenance company that's a full pest control, lawn maintenance, irrigation company. And those increases will have to be, uh, of course, passed down to the homeowner when we start bumping up against those minimum wage 
increases to put us in, in scale. All right, very good. Well, um, that's all the questions that are coming in for you right now, but you're certainly welcome as we go through the panelists to jump in and add to um, different panelists discussions. Uh, right now, we're gonna move to Richard Hudak. And he's again, Director of Quality Assurance for uh, Lennar Homes in the Tampa division. And Rick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dukes. Um, yeah, we actually started on this back in uh, 2015 when we attended an irrigation workshop. And it was also a workshop to how to establish a lawn in 30 days, which we were very interested in because at the time we were spending a lot of extra money on irrigation and we were actually killing sod because we didn't understand we were overwatering sod. So um, what we learned at the workshop, Dr. Dukes laid out a lawn establishment program to water a lawn, certain amount, certain times of the day for 30 days and you can actually establish it. Um, what I'd like to do, Emily, if you could throw up that irrigation chart real quick. Yeah, so what we, what we found out was that um, on day one, we would water the lawn three times a day. Um, very minimal, six, six minutes on the fixed spray, 18 on the rotors. And then day two to 10, we changed the times to just two times a day, eight minutes on the fixed spray, 24 on the rotor. 11 to 15, we changed it again. What we were doing and what his program was establishing was that we were rooting the grass into the soil. What we were doing before, um, how we had always developed a lawn was you just throw water on it. Um, if it turns brown, it's gonna die, so water it. And what was happening was the roots were not going down. We weren't weaning it into the soil and it was just laying there waiting for the water to come. And we were given plenty of it. Um, so with this program, by day 31, you've established watering times one time a day or twice or twice a week, one time a week or twice a week, depending on the municipality and uh, the irrigation system. But we found out that we could actually save money save water and it was monumental. I mean, we were saving anywhere from half to two thirds of the water supply. It wasn't easy getting here and that's where Chris Dewey, also Frank Aldo, uh, Pasco County and uh, other members helping us, but, but Dewey between his tuna cans, which I learned a lot about tuna cans. I thought they were just to eat tuna out of, but they were measuring water. And our challenges on our different soils from sand to clay um, took different irrigation timings. Um, what also helped us get this way, get to this point was the uh, soil meters um, that measured the moisture in the soil. You know, we'd always use just the rain gauge, um, rain sensors, um, which we found out that the soil sensors are much more efficient, but then there was challenges as to where to place them. If you placed them in the swale, they didn't read properly. If you place, place them under a tree, didn't read properly. If you place them too close to the driveway, the concrete, the heat off the driveway or the heat off the street. So that's where, you know, again, Chris Dewey came into play and uh, helped us make all those adjustments. Um, we tested this system in two different counties, Pasco and Hillsboro, uh, three homes at a time, 30 days time. Um, we reviewed it every day until we got it established. Um, I never learned so much about graphs and charts and tracking um, as I did with uh, Chris because he would update us monthly and really got it turned around. So um, I learned a lot about the uh, UF extensions um, and how they reach out to Pasco, Hernando, 
between Paula Staples, uh, even Tampa Water, uh, Julia. Um, they've all been great helping us establish this. The other thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, landscape bubblers. What we learned from there too is that uh, if you're directing the bubblers to trees, to certain landscape, uh, not using the spray edge, you're not wasting water that way either. Uh, you'd be surprised how much water you can just release into the air uh, instead of directing it exactly to the roots in that section. Since then, we're also looking into and started using um, one sod company, a loving group, uh, Sod Farms. They're establishing a upgraded St. Augustine. This is uh, much like the Pro Vista, Scott's Pro Vista sod that maybe you've heard about. But it's a slow growing, greener uh, St. Augustine. You mow it half the time. Um, so instead of mowing in the heavy rainy season once a week, you can mow it twice a month, which is monumental. Um, not to mention for carbon releases. Also, we're looking at a AquaSmart water management uh, system. It's like a fertilizer, but it uh, helps retain the moisture 12 times its weight, and then it slowly releases the moisture. Um, we're looking at this too and hoping to have everything in place by the end of this year. We're already starting it in a lot of our different communities. Um, we're diff working out different systems on how to apply the AquaSmart and when's the best time uh, so that it can hold in the moisture. So the other thing that we really stepped up is utilizing these cards, this establishment card. We're making them, we're laminating them, making them uh, uh, about twice the size of a business card where they're legible and uh, give them to other homeowners as we're closing. Because it's really important, our homeowners, we're, we're making sure that their clocks are set right at the time of the closing. But what we're finding out too is that a lot of times our homeowners on a time clock never even knew what the A, B, C, and D was on their clocks as far as the different uh, seasons summer, fall, winter, and spring. And you can see that we've adjusted these times. So it's a lot of education for the homeowners too. We're worried about the first 30 to 60 days once we install the sod. And then the homeowner takes over from there. So we can save them a lot of money and save a lot of water by them following this card. And that's why we leave it with them at every closing. Very good. Are you uh, ready for a couple? There's a couple comments and a couple questions. Sure. Actually, I, have, I have a couple questions myself, but sure. thanks for that. I, I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, you articulated this relationship that you had with County Extension, both Chris Dewey and Frank Gaudo, Pasco County. And it seems like that relationship was an important um, piece to making, you know, making this work. I mean, they if you had a problem, I, I remember Chris, you know, he would go visit with you uh, pretty routinely. A lot. So, uh, you know, just, just comment on the comment on that is that, you know, I mean, that seems to be the secret sauce. I guess it's what I'm getting at. It, it is the secret sauce is just to reach out to all you guys. And there's so much to this extensions and, uh, you know, you're all willing to help. Um, it even went to our homeowners, um, help them. And then, then Chris would report back to me. Uh, what kind of calls he was getting and why. So, you know, we were checking it not only during the construction phase, but after the construction phase through the homeowners also, even letting us know, you know, who we need to educate more. Um, so, I mean, that's really an important part, when, especially when you're developing a program. I mean, we've been working on this since 2015 and we keep getting and learning more and more every year. But um, yeah, that's where, you know, the extensions, I mean, you guys have been great. And um, 
well, thank you for that. I'll, I'll take the thank you for that on behalf of everyone here <laughs> who can't talk, but um, there were, uh, let me ask you this, were there naysayers when you when you started out on this with the 30 days doing, going from what you did do to the 30 day along the way, were there naysayers? And, and if there were, how did you, how did you respond or react? Well, it was really, it was really tough at first because, you know, I've been in construction in the industry for going on 37 years. And even when I was building homes at the time, uh, you know, you had to throw water on it. And we were setting the clocks. We were watering seven days a week, an hour zone, whether it was a rotor or whether it was a spray head. And we were just flooding these homes. So not only were we getting twelve and fourteen hundred dollar water bills, but we were also rotting, root rotting all the grass, uh, especially between the homes. So we were replacing a lot of sod. So trying to change that, you know, turn that big ship was very tough because just our division alone has a hundred construction managers. So changing that mindset to where, what do you mean we we're not over watering? You know, we got to turn back the clock, and it was between even our sod companies, our irrigation companies, uh, we had to get everyone on board. Um, a lot of meetings, uh, a lot of buy-in because um, you know, you're changing the industry is what you're doing. Yep. And uh, we found out that, uh, you know, you know what you're talking about, Dr. Dukes, your program works. So, you know, we just had to tweak it a little bit to make it work for us. I'm, I'm just gonna have to get you to tell my wife that. Because, uh, <laughs> I don't know if she's on board with that part. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks for those words. Uh, I'll just go through. There's some questions here. We should have plenty of time. Um, a question and a comment. How often are your customers willing to pay for irrigation checks? Maybe not a full wet check each time that then verifies each, each zone is running and any needed adjustments for envision, for any needed adjustments for individual heads. Um. <clears throat> Mainly, we're still having some difficulty between the homes because both irrigation companies with our, with our neighbors, if they have them set for the same time and those spray heads are both spraying, you're double watering that. So, you know, it's not so much as turning down the timers or just in the clock, we're screwing down the heads to where we're restricting the water that's coming out of the heads. Um, we've tried to zone in between the homes, um, but we're very, having very few customers uh, with irrigation issues. Okay. Um, another comment and then a question is, we often find irrigation systems still in establishment setting of irrigating twice a day uh, or every day when we visit sites one to two years after installation. We especially see this when there's reclaimed water as the source, since there's no price pressure. How do we get the industry to set timers appropriately once the established period has passed? Well, that's a little bit of a different type of question because it's not costing anyone anything. Mm -hmm. um, paying for the reclaim, other than uh, they're going to be replacing their sod because it, they're going to rot it. Uh, root rot, not to mention they're washing all the nutrients and fertilizers out of the soil by overwatering. And, um, you know, even though you do have reclaim and, you're, and you have the capability of doing that, um, it, it is going to harm your, your grass. Um, the best we can do is, you know, supply these watering cards and uh, continue to educate. And uh, when we do go out on customers with lawns, with uh, with issues like that, um, we can actually tell them that they are overwatering their lawns. Yep. And of course, I think implementing the soil moisture sensor irrigation controllers can also mitigate that overwatering as well. Uh, and and Philip spoke to the Hunter Hydroize system that they use, and I think Adam's probably going to talk about some technologies uh, that they use as well. Uh, let's see. Is there a name for the slower growing greener St. Augustine grass? I think they're asking about the name of the grass that you all mentioned. Well, right now it's um, what they're naming it is an upgraded St. Augustine. It's, it's probably gonna come up with like a 2.0, you know how that goes nowadays. Um, but it's it's the same as a Pro Vista, you know, the Scott's Pro Vista sod is just going to be their own developed name. Uh, what that is, we should know probably by the end of the year. Okay. 
And of course, our, our turf grass breeders have um, come up with some new breeds as well, and they're always searching for those new breeds. And it's my belief that probably, you know, the breeding turf grass takes a long time. And it's my belief that uh, eventually they'll get to a point where they're, they're breeding a grass that uh, probably cuts the water needs in half and maybe even nu nutrition needs in half. And some of the, I think Captiva is the new uh, turf grass. Uh, somebody feel free to comment. It's a new one that, you know, even with less water, it stays greener longer. So um, anyway, I think that's the future. Uh, another question, are you setting mowers, mowing standards uh, like cannot mow shorter than three to four inches? Um, in, other, in other words, are you eliminating scalping and, and promoting proper mowing? I think you are, aren't you? Yeah, that, that's really important because uh, you're just going to brown it out if you do mow it any shorter than that. Citra Blue, I knew I'd be corrected by our turf grass colleagues. <laughs> Citra Blue is the new UF St. Augustine grass. Thank you, everybody. Um, question, how many gallons of uh, water do you save for St. Augustine grass establishment? With this watering system that we're think, doing now? Yeah, I think that's the question. Yeah, well, we've, we've saved almost, it depends on the area, the soil, uh, but it's up to two thirds. Yeah, I think some of the numbers I saw that uh, Chris put together when he, when you guys were working together in the initial days, it was 50% was an easy savings during that establishment yep. period. Yep. And you saved the money, you didn't have to replace the sod. That, that's right. That, and that was, a, that was a bonus because we didn't know that uh, it was going to eliminate the sod replacement because we were replacing oh, probably 25% of the sod uh, by overwatering it. And we didn't know that that's what was killing it. Very good. Uh, another question. This is Frank from Pasco County. Um, he says a couple other UF recommendations that you have implemented and worth mentioning taller sprinkler heads to allow for the correct mowing height and uh, separate zones for the, the shady areas between homes. So um, the work continues, I guess, is the message. It, it does. It does. You know, and, and Frank's uh, continually, he, he definitely took over. Uh, where Chris, uh, he's never going to be able to fill Chris's shoes, of course. And sorry for saying that, Frank, but you know that. Uh, but he's doing a great job and working close with us and uh, just doing a great job for the county. So we had another question come in. It's, it's really a question on turf grass varieties. Why does the panhandle prefer centipede turf, not the more common grasses that's used in the peninsula? I'll let, uh, we've got a bunch of turf experts on the line. Uh, I'll let them comment in the chat. And of course we have uh, our turf experts lined up. I know we have Dr. Kenworthy uh, in one of the future sessions that's gonna talk about turf grasses. So tune in for that future panel. All right, well, thank you, Rick. I think we'll move on to our next panelists. And uh, we have Adam Jones, who, as I said, is a, the Vice President and a Director of Quality Assurance with Massey Services, and has done a lot of work on the ground with irrigation efficiency and irrigation services. So, Adam, you're up. Thanks, Michael, I appreciate that. Um, so again, the question that Michael asked me originally was really give a state of the industry so to speak, uh, from a perspective of Massey Services. Obviously the state of the industry, most people are thinking about the effects of the COVID pandemic and how that's impacted business. But I kind of wanted to launch from a different, a little bit more historical perspective. I've been in the industry for 38 years, um, primarily in the lawn care and pest control industry, obviously, 30 years here at Massey Services. So I've seen a lot of changes over the years and from where we've come to where we are today. And I'll talk about it from a perspective of how water use efficiency in the urban landscape has impacted the lawn care industry predominantly. Um, and going back in time, um, for my career, the majority of the problems that I have addressed as a service provider to customers in residential settings for their landscape has been rooted in water, no pun intended. And back in the day, it was really too much water. When we had an open water window in Florida, um, installers and landscapers in general basically wanted to water more frequent um, for shorter periods of time. And so back in the day, the majority of the problems that we dealt with as um, lawn care professionals 
was dealing with weeds associated with excess moisture and uh, root rot disease decline as a result of excessively wet situations. And that was the primary cause of problems that we fought day in and day out. And, and it was a constant battle between lawn care operators and the customer to try and get control over that irrigation system and, and uh, become more effective at its use so we could grow quality landscapes. And as time has gone on, we have changed the scope of the urban landscape. If you go back to the early 1990s in central Florida, here in Orlando, for example, the average size of, the, of our lawn care square footage was roughly about 9,000 square feet. Today, that same urban landscape lawn care um, footprint is about 3,500 square feet. So has there been a dramatic reduction in the size of the cover of the lawn care turf grass? Um, so as a result of that, the landscape obviously has changed in terms of its size and its, its makeup and what's going on in it. Um, but the one thing that really hasn't changed is that every irrigation system that's installed is installed incorrectly. Um, and then it's never maintained as a general, I'm generalizing obviously, but quite frankly, I've never done an irrigation inspection. We didn't find a significant problem with the irrigation system, whether it be in terms of original design or, or in terms of the operating efficiency of it at the time that I've looked at it. So to address that, about 11 years ago, I finally had reached the end of my um, rope, if you will, on dealing with it because I couldn't, I couldn't really make a difference in the urban landscape beyond what I was doing. So we decided to actually enter into that side of the business to start managing irrigation systems. And as a result of that, we have taken our customer base in the last 11 years, we currently have about um, 100,000 recurring lawn care customers that we service on a recurring basis. And now to today, we about 20% of those customers have our irrigation maintenance services. So I think somebody was asking earlier about how, um, how effective is it or how, how successful are you at getting customers to pay for irrigation ch checks? And, and it's kind of like a blue ocean strategy in my mind. Not a lot of people are doing it. We were kind of innovators in this regard. And um, as a result of that, we've been able to make a huge impact on not just the quality of our customers' landscapes, but in terms of reducing what I'll call wasted usage of water. We're trying to figure out how to make every gallon go to some beneficial purpose. And it's, it's less about how much water you can reduce over the course of a year, um, because quite frankly, in many cases, we increase water use over the course of a year, but it goes to a beneficial purpose. Um, so that's, that's kind of a highly variable customer by customer. Um, but so today, um, for, for example, you, you will find customers that um, if, they, if they have a problem with irrigation, they basically have two choices. Three, I guess you could say, really. One, they can go down to the big box store and try to do it themselves. And after they've made seven trips back and forth to that box store and screwed it up and glued themselves to their pants and got blue, blue glue everywhere, um, they finally fed up with it. And then you try to call an irrigation professional. And um, in most cases, irrigation professionals do not do a lot of recurring maintenance for residential services. Secondly, if you had to get somebody there today, that really isn't gonna happen, particularly in May, June or July, April, May or June, really, when uh, all the problems are showing up in the landscape. So we saw an opportunity to, A, just respond to a customer. And that was really the, the issue for, for many consumers. Instead of waiting two weeks for an irrigation professional to show up, we could be there the same day. And that's kind of been our strategy to be that, that quick response um, customer, or, or excuse me, a contractor for the consumer. So what we focus on really is going in and identifying, A, basically what's broken, figuring out what it's gonna to take to fix what's broken. And then from there, embark upon a long-term strategy of upgrading the irrigation system to improve its operating efficiency. Um, I think there was a comment earlier about MP rotators and, and MP rotators have been a huge game changer for us as a consumer. We're the largest user of MP rotators in the country. And um, when you look at what happens typically in an urban landscape, originally it's designed with rotors in mind for turf grass areas, which in a smaller footprint with angular shapes, um, rotors are really not the design component necessary to, to be very efficient in those locations. So we've replaced a lot of rotors over the last 11 years with MP rotators. And uh, the, the real dynamic of that has been that one of the bigger problems with urban landscapes over time is that 
Water pressure at the head is a, is a big issue. Rotors prefer to have 50 PSI at the head. And typically we're looking at irrigation systems when we first show up that are running 20 to 22 per PSI at the head, which is not a, not a very good thing to begin with. So by slowing that water flow down and reducing the water flow, we've been able to improve the operating pressure of the head. And then by improving the row spacing, head spacing and row spacing, we've been able to improve overall um, uniformity of the irrigation system. Now that just gets to the beginning of the problem in the urban landscape. It then becomes a matter of managing ongoing that water use and when do we water. I talked earlier about open water windows back in the old days. Well, since the onset of water restrictions, we have killed more grass in the state of Florida and side lovers love it because they get to sell more grass to the same customer every year. Um, but we kill more lawns because of twice a week watering schedules than, any, than you can imagine. Um, and so the real issue there is, can we really manage a, a stand, significant stand of turf grass in full sun on twice a week watering schedule? And that becomes very, very difficult without timely rain, as if God mandated that the lawns would only need water on Tuesdays and Fridays or whatever day it is. It just doesn't work in reality. So we've been really focusing on how to address that singular issue. And um, ET-based controls have been the most impactful for us. We replace about 16,000 irrigation controllers a year. The majority of those are going in with technology that is either capable of being upgraded to an ET-based controller or is an ET-based controller. And that's having significant um, improvements in the overall health of the landscape. Um, the other side of that goes back to the soil and really the components of the soil. And Phil talked earlier about his composting program. And we do a lot of that. We do it, unfortunately, we do it after the landscape's been installed. Phil's doing it before the landscape's installed, which is the, the best place to, to be focusing on it. But we do a lot of, of um, aeration and top dressing with um, activated compost. And it, from my experience in 38 years, there's never been a practice or a product that you can go in and, and, and treat a, a ailing landscape and improve it um, in many different ways. One from the health of the overall soil community to the efficiency of the fertilizer usage in the landscape to the reduction of wasted water. Um, organic matter is a key component of managing irrigation systems. If you can get more organic matter into our sandy soils, we can hold more water in the root zone, thereby, thereby we can get longer intervals between irrigation events. And on a twice a week closed water window, that may be the difference between life and death in some landscapes. So we see um, top dressing with compost as being the future of the urban landscape. It's just a matter of how to figure out how to get that effectively inculcated in the culture of construction as well as in the minds of consumers today. Um, that business for us is growing at about 15% a year. Um, from when we started out two years ago, from zero revenue, we're doing about a million dollars a year in revenue just from top dressing and top um, aerating and top dressing with activated compost. So that business is growing. It's been a huge impact in uh, our ability to effectively solve some of the issues that we've never been able to solve in the urban landscape. Um, so the other side of this, Doc wanted to talk about a little bit is about the effects of COVID. You know, if I go back to January, 2020, um, I was in training sessions. Uh, we have our CEU courses where we go and we have to re-educate all our team members and get their continuing education credits. We do that in-house. So it normally takes us about a month, month and a half to go through all the 2,400 team members across seven states we service and get those courses done. We do them in person with our own in-house training staff. Well, today that, that same training regimen is gonna take us until April 1st. Uh, because of social distancing and how we're doing the meetings now. Um, you know, a lot of us are doing Zoom meetings like this, but unfortunately with, with technicians and people that work with their hands for a living, they don't like to sit in front of a cute computer for eight hours. So that's not the best way to educate those individuals. You still need in-face interaction with people in a, in a more social setting in order to be effective at that. So we've had to take rooms that we would normally have 50 to 100 people in and break it down into numerous rooms with no more than 12 to 15 people. So that's, that's been a huge impact in terms of the effort it takes to continue to, to develop your team members. 
Um, and, and that's something I think that's going to be impacting us in the, not just the near term, but maybe in a longer term version as things go on. We don't know how that's going to impact us. So um, the business is growing. I would tell you that COVID has not damaged the business. It's, it's certainly um, impacted the, um, the way people think and the way people operate, obviously. But if you think about it, the average consumer who used to be going to work from nine to five is now sitting at home watching his grass grow. So everybody's like one of the old uh, retired villagers now out in Central Florida. They all look at grass and anytime something wrong, guess who they're calling? They're calling us. So we have to be there to respond. But our business has grown this year. It's not backed up by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so the industry is strong and consumers and people are still gonna take care of their property no matter what. So that's good for our industry. For young people looking for an opportunity, our business is recession proof. People are not gonna live with bugs in their house and they're not gonna let their lawns die. With that, let's touch on some of the questions. Um, let me see here. So uh, one comment slash question is, I'm concerned about scheduled spraying of herbicides and pesticides, fertilizers uh, that eliminate insects in, in yards. We know that these insects are crucial for environmental balance. Is the spray industry adapting with that in mind? How are you educating your customers that insects, not all insects are bad? Sure. Yeah, so if you want to understand the way that we think as lawn care operators of spraying an insecticide or a pesticide of any type, it's nothing more than an expense. And if I could get away with not doing that, I would do that. So we have no vested interest in broadcasting pesticides. At Massey Services, we stopped broadcasting, quote unquote, pesticides back in probably 1992. I think that was when we really moved away from this general practice of you know, we've done it this way for 50 years, we spray lawns. So we target those pesticide applications specifically. Some species of St. Augustine grass, for example, require more concern about broadcasting. For example, you have to broadcast at least once a year for chinch bug management in most St. Augustine lawns. Otherwise, the likelihood of you having damage is significant. But the broadcasting of post-emergent herbicides is not a practice that we currently do. We haven't done it in numerous years. Fungicide application is, is insignificant in the urban landscape overall in terms of a broadcasting standpoint. It's very spot oriented. Um, so from a lawn care perspective, if we could get away with using zero pesticides, that's what we would be doing. The similarly with fertilizer, we're trying to reduce the amount of fertilizer that we use. And um, if I had to tell you from an environmental standpoint, that's probably the biggest buzz item in, in the industry is fertilizer. Um, everybody is trying to regulate it. Um, and there, there are situations and places in Florida where we literally cannot apply fertilizer during the growing season, which is insane if you understand plants and the need of, of supplemental nutrition in the urban landscape. But going back to our compost program, compost program, that is probably one of the best responses to that growing regulation of fertilizer during the growing season. Improving the overall health of the soil improves the performance of those plants during those times when you cannot supplement them with nutrition. Okay, so your comment about water restrictions created a lot of questions, a lot of buzz. So, um, and they're all centered around this, this concept that uh, asking, please clarify how we have killed more lawns due to twice a week watering restrictions. If an established lawn can't live with two days a week irrigation, I would argue it's not the correct plant in the correct place and that resodding is not the answer. And the other questions are, are very similar to that in that vein. So, well, it, if it, that, that's a, I guess that's somewhat of a political and philosophical question for a lot of people. I don't care what I'm growing. If, if I'm growing grass or if I'm growing shrubs, to me, I'm, in, I'm, I'm apolitical about that. But when I have to grow St. Augustine grass, or if I have to grow zoysia grass or bahia grass, I have to provide enough water at a frequency necessary to keep it healthy. Now, if you think about this, some from a political standpoint, the health of the lawn is less important to a politician than it is to the urban owner of a home, okay? If you're a homeowner and you want green grass, you want help live green grass. You don't want a stand of grass with intermittent dead spots or periodic dead spots as a result of irrigation deficiencies or lack of frequent enough rainfall. 
So um, I, I kind of disagree. I think that St. Augustine grass is very well adapted to our Florida climate and our conditions here. The issue is not how much water it needs, but how frequent it needs. Um, I see untold gallons of wasted water under water restrictions because the average homeowner who has a irrigation system sets it to those restrictions and it could have rained the day before. And there it goes again tomorrow, irrigating for a full cycle of irrigation event when it doesn't need it. So my concern is less with the amount of water that we're using as much as the frequency of availability of water. With proper management practices, I think opening a water window up to a potential of up to three days per week as necessary is going to save more water in the long run than the water restrictions have had saved over, over the last 15, 20 years, however long it's in Central Florida. And I think uh, before we go on to a couple more questions, I think uh, Philip wanted to mention something related to your comments as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dukes. I just wanted to, to point out to uh, Adam, you, you brought up the your approach on irrigation and, and with homeowners and picking up that phone call, making the call to a local contractor. And that's that again going back to the the irrigation professionalism. You know the FNGLA has been been very active with uh, helping rewrite the Florida Friendly Landscape Irrigation Design Standards, and we've approached uh, FDEP and the water management districts to to garner support from them on those those uh, valuable documents, uh, and we're we're waiting to hear back from from our partners with FDEP and the water management districts, but. Um, you know, just a couple other things too that you, you, we talked about with them, MP ro rotators, you know, uh, MP rotators are great. We use them here. The, the best part about them is if they're installed correctly, the, the other benefit is the match precipitation rates that you get from, from the, the heads. Um, you know, the compost products and, and going back to uh, the way we do it here, we don't actually put it down before the landscape goes in. We've investigated that and, and we're, uh, approaching that that subject uh, to, to make sure that's going to work for our, our our structure but the biggest part about landscapes is getting that soil maturity and and when we started that project with with dr bean that was one of my hypothesis if you will is that it just takes about three to five years to really mature a landscape once it's brand new and that's just the nutrient recycling get the organics down the soil um so you know, and, and I agree with you 100% on, on pest control. You know, you're not necessarily just going out there every time. You're going out there to control a specific pest now. Uh, you know, if you're going to treat for army worms, you're putting something out, you know, just for the army worm population when it, when it starts popping up in, in June, July. Um, so, and then uh, one last thing too with the, Stacy had a question about homeowners and irrigation schedules. That's one of the beauties of the HydroWise system is that as a developer, we can go in and change the programming automatically before that house even gets closed. Or if they close beforehand, we actually hang on to that, that irrigation system and change it for them so we know it's done correctly. So th there's a lot of things out there that, you know, I think education is crucial to our homeowners, but it's also educating the, the contractors. So thank you for that. A couple more questions for Adam, and then uh, we'll move on. If we don't address a question, what we will aim to do is we'll aim to do that in our blog, blog post where we can expand upon it. Um, lethal viral necrosis, is that affecting, do you see that out there in your world, Adam? We are, especially in Southeast Florida. Um, so it's, it's becoming more and more of an issue. Okay. Um, Adam Dale asks, I'm curious how you foresee pesticide use changing over the next five to 10 years. Are there any new lawn and ornamental innovations or regulations that may affect pesticide use? Any changes you anticipate significantly alter the way the landscape pest control industry operates? Okay, let's try to unpack that again. Give me that first. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of different. How do you foresee pesticide use changing over the next five to 10 years? Essentially, what's on the horizon for either innovations or maybe regulations that could affect the way we're doing business now? Yeah. So from my perspective over the last 38 years, the, the way in which we apply materials has not dramatically changed. 
from a technology standpoint, from an equipment stem standpoint, from a, a overarching treatment methodology. So I think that, that if there's gonna be innovation, it's probably gonna be in those areas, particularly in the, on the equipment side, something that's going to reduce the labor associated with the application of that. Um, it's been a, a huge challenge um, for lawn care companies to manage that piece of the business. And you think about what it takes to, to do that. We went from back when we first started to driving down the road with huge tanks of mixed material in the back of a tank, driving from house to house to much smaller trucks with carrying water around to house to house and then mixing small batches at the site specific to the needs of the property. And now not taking hardly any water around and using consumers water sources to provide the water that we put just on their landscape. So that's kind of changed over the way in terms of the size and scope of those vehicles. But in terms of the end of the hose, the application, it's pretty much the same it's been for the last 38 years. And I, I would expect to see a lot of changes in the near term around technology for applications. Um, and that could go along with efficacy because it's highly inefficient in terms of the way we apply materials today. Very good. Well, there are some outstanding questions. Uh, I'd like to get to our last panelist and make sure we have enough time uh, for him. As I said, we will uh, endeavor to address questions. There's a lot of good comments in the chat as well, but we'll endeavor to address questions in our blog post. All right, for our final speaker, we have Mike Sweeney, uh, Deputy Executive Director, Toho Water Authority, who is going to tell us about his world. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Dukes, and uh, it's a pleasure to be virtually here. And uh, this uh, panel has been great. Um, a lot of different perspectives around. So what Dr. Dukes told me before in the green room before we got started is to mention if we have any challenges that uh, need to be addressed, um, you know, share them with the audience and our audience is pretty big. Um, so in exchange to do that, I think I'm gonna need the next five or six weeks of seminar time to cover it all. But seriously, I do have some slides that will hopefully keep me on track to kind of summarize. I'm gonna try to bring those up real quick. And hopefully you can see that. And I'll go to slide mode. And before I begin, um, just I'm going to give obviously the the um, the public supply perspective, and uh, you'll see that we're Toho Water Authority smack dab in the middle of the CFWI area, the Central Florida Water Initiative area that was mentioned earlier. Um, one of our main challenges, not the only one, but it's a really important one, is obviously meeting our projections for. Uh, water supply. And um, I'm going to probably deviate from this presentation briefly just to show you one slide and then come back to it. Um, you'll see that we have a number of things that we're doing to address the, the amount of growth that we've been seeing and anticipate in our service area. And so alternative water supplies are going to be uh, Emily, are you still there? I am. I think he's frozen. Yeah, he's frozen. We got a comment from BJ that um, they could not see his slide. Okay, hold on. I'm going to remove his spotlight. Oh, there he is. Mike, can you hear us? Yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I can quickly call in, is there, um, hang on just a sec. Well, in the meantime, while we're waiting on him, why don't you go ahead and continue with some of these other comments and questions? Oh, there he is. Mike, while you're calling in, we're going to hit on a couple questions. Just let us just speak up, interrupt us when you call back in. Um, let me see, where was I? Okay, so um, 
with the pandemic, this is for you, Adam, after your talk, with the pandemic and people spending more time at home, we've observed many homeowners transform their typical landscape to gardens. How is the industry adapting to this? Um, as I said earlier, I'm kind of ambivalent or apolitical, if you will, about species, whether they're growing shrubs or whether they're growing grass, it matters nothing to me. I've still got to figure out how to provide the right um, and appropriate con management practices to make that as healthy as possible for the consumer. So it's fine for us. We, we've actually, we do renovations ourselves for consumers. So an, a great example is this, is that people tend to um, wait too long to transition some lawn areas into bed areas because of shade under trees. And so we spend a lot of time enacting that process with our customers when they start complaining about why the grass won't grow on, in, under a closet, basically, <laughs> of a canopy and trying to explain the dynamics of how plants grow there. So um, that is happening. Um, and I go back to the size and the scope. Number one, the footprint of the total property is going down in size. So therefore the footprint of lawn is going down in size. In addition, we're seeing more landscapes going in earlier than before. Um, whereas the typical builder package is a very minimal or sparse landscape or in terms of the size of it, the footprint that it covers initially. In many cases, it's overplanted for the future of the landscape. So we address that, that downstream. I think that um, more consumers are investing more into landscape beds now earlier in the life side of the property than before. Yeah, I, um, th the question was really to the, to the point was uh, vegetable gardens, but I think, oh. But I don't know if you've seen a lot of that. That was really a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, square foot gardening, gardening is on the rise. Um, that's pretty commonplace now. You know, 20 years ago, you wouldn't see a lot of that in the urban landscape. Um, right. It's very common to see it today. Okay. Um, there was a question I was hoping to get to if we had time. Have you looked at the re looked into reducing fertilizer applications when adding the compost? Um, if so, have you implemented any reductions in your fertility routine? incorporating increased nutrient cycling due to enhanced soil ecosystems. So have you altered your traditional fertilizer? Yeah, I saw that, that question earlier. And, and just to give you a history, we, we are a minimalist when it comes to fertilizer inputs. We are not trying to sell the greenest lawn on the block. And quite frankly, the greenest lawn on the block is usually not the healthiest lawn on the block in most cases. So many years ago, we began reducing our fertilizer nutrient inputs. So we're down at the very low side of inputs in terms of trying to maintain a healthy, a kind of a, a balance between excessive growth and too, too lush of a landscape, which promotes more and more disease issues, as well as more, more um, other ancillary problems that go along the way in terms of water use efficiency also, excuse me. Um, so, so we're on the very low end of that. I would tell you the biggest thing that has happened is that new landscapes coming from dredged soils are the biggest issue that we struggle with from an agronomic standpoint in fertilizer and nutrient input. And activated compost has been the most effective way in addressing that particular issue. I've had lawns that um, three years after planting, I could still see the sod squares where you just, no matter what you did, you couldn't get it to respond or to establish effectively, particularly in zoysia grass. Um, it has to do with the condition of the soil, high pH environments, things of that nature. And activated compost has been the most effective way at addressing those problems and getting a soil, as Phil talked about, a mature soil that's productive. Um, and if you can get a mature productive soil, you can get by on very minimal amounts of inputs, fertilizer. That's key. Very good. Uh, let me touch base with Mike. Mike, did you connect? You're muted. Still muted. That's funny. I'm I'm calling. <laughs> yeah, I think you have your computer audio and your phone audio on simultaneously. And now you're muted. We never had to do. We never had this before Zoom. Now we have things like this, right? How about, now? How, about now? How about now? Sounds like you're in the Grand Canyon. Well, my phone's, my phone's 
I'm going to hang up the phone. Okay. Maybe uh, you could turn your you could turn your video off and share your screen. That might that might work. The video is probably clogging up your bandwidth. Okay, I see. All right, now try your share. Does that work? Uh, yep. Okay. You can, if you want to put it in presentation mode, you can, or you can just navigate through the slides. I think I'll just do the safe route, if you don't okay. mind. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry that that, that happened. So, um, and hate to interrupt the flow of the questions. So what I was getting to is water conservation just playing a really key role here with um, making sure that we're going after the so-called cheapest water, but also uh, to make sure that the alternative water supply projects have some cushion because the, the on, uh, when they come online over the next 20 years or so, um, that there, there is some cushion there to keep up with. I'm gonna bring out too toward the end of this, it's gonna be a short presentation, is what role innovation and public-private partnerships will play um, in the form of a grant that we received from DEP recently, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So um, Toho by the numbers, we've been around since 2003. We were formed by the city of Kissimmee in Osceola County, and uh, we have, uh, and also Polk County is part of our service area, about 350 employees. Um, here's the size of our system. We are about 115,000 customers totally. We have uh, automatic metering infrastructure, which playing a really key role with water conservation monitoring. Um, this is how many water and water reclamation facilities we have, around some 21. And what's key here is uh, we're spread out. We're just, you know, expanding rapidly to, to meet up the, meet with the government, uh, with, with development. This is the Central Florida Water Initiative area that was carved out by the central, uh, by, by uh, legislation. And we kind of sit in the middle of it. Our, our service area is quite large. It's, it's technically all of Osceola County except for St. Cloud, but we only cover really the northern portion, which is the urbanized area. So um, how are we promoting water use efficiency is the typical categories you'll run across our, uh, public water suppliers is inclining rate structure to send an economic signal to our users to, to cut back. We also have reclaim water systems that's pretty extensive and various outreach programs associated with uh, water conservation, um, irrigation restrictions. We're talking a lot about that today and promoting and, inc and incenting uh, folks to use less water. We also provide, it's not listed here, a lot of free services. If somebody calls up and has a question about their controller, if they're a new resident, new customer, um, that is something that we provide. We will schedule a call and get out there or do it over the phone to help them get off of what they're doing and maybe diagnose that they may have a bad controller and, and um, provide some additional um, recommendations there. These are the typical uh, public education and awareness programs. Um, if you're in the utility business and any business for that matter, we're using all the channels that are available to us. Um, it's a really hard sell in Central Florida, anywhere in Florida for that matter, given how much water is on the surface and people that are new to the state and they're moving down here rapidly. Um, why could there be any problem with <laughs> having enough, not enough water? Well, everybody knows the story behind that. I won't get into that, but it's, it is a challenge to get people's head around the fact that they need to be diligent about their water use. Um, Automatic metering infrastructure I mentioned earlier is obviously the data that we bring in not only for billing purposes, but we're using it to monitor water restriction enforcement. We're using that data for evaluation and further analysis and is also an opportunity for education and awareness. Something that we don't have on the slide here is customer engagement. We're adding a piece onto this that we'll be monitoring more closely water usage and um, be able to alert the customer to, if we feel like they're uh, using water excessively rather than waiting for a phone call to us. Let's get something out there in the form of a text or an email to let them know. Um, water conservation program and effectiveness is my next area I want to touch on. Um, these are the services that we provide and I just touched on earlier. We do do a number of different e evaluations. 
We do have the Florida Water Star program. Actually, it's a derivative of it. It's, we call it the Toho Assistance Program. It's very much based on water, uh, Florida Water Star, and it's required to follow that for outside and inside, um, if you will, appliances, fixtures, turf, and, and, and irrigation percentage of the area to uh, develop in, in our service area. It is a requirement and there are inspections. One thing we did recently is to take a look at the cost of doing each of these services and um, to save you all the numbers and all the blurry reading that, that I don't want to get into is enforcement is obviously seems to be the, uh, the big push. It's hard to measure uh, inclining block rate and what pressures it might put on and, and incentives to put on in terms of saving water. But that's one way to do it. But what, right now, we don't do any fining. We do kind of a three strikes and you're out. It's automated through our AMI system. A letter gets kicked out. And if you get that third letter, we can cut off your irrigation as part of our, um, our if you will, service to the customer. We rarely get to that point. We usually get their attention after the second or the third letter. But that seems to be doing uh, the most good right now. So what I want to touch on briefly is a UF study that was done in 2017 that really alerted us to an opportunity and researchers and uh, University of Florida faculty is no exception to this. It lives um, for bimodal distributions. And we found a big one here as a result of Nick Taylor's work and, and others that were involved with this project with us. So what we were looking at is Florida Water Star as it was known at the time, owner maintained water usage and did a comparison between a control and, and how they were maintaining it. And we compare that usage with uh, master manage, which was actually <laughs> uh, using much more water than the control, uh, quite a bit of water. And rather than getting the fi figures here, we don't have time for that. But that alerted to us of, of the importance of segmenting our water users, not simply as high water users versus nominal, but folks that are looking at managing the property different and diving even further is what are they doing in terms of systems and efficiencies there that can be drawn. Part of that uh, period of time and kind of parallel to that time was the development of H2O save. I believe we've heard about this uh, maybe a couple of different times over the last maybe two years or so. Another UF initiative that we've been a part of along with other utilities and it's growing, it's adding utilities to it's it is the very least a screening tool that we can look at segmenting the, the users and start figuring out how we can tailor messaging, um, and even you know enforcement if you have to, uh, to, to curb that water usage. Um, it, as I said, it's part of the University of Florida program for resource efficiency communities. Um, TWA is a contributor, we pro provide data, it gets loaded periodically. We also, or should say, University of Florida researchers have coupled it with property appraiser data, our AMI records, our conservation case history files, and of course, layered with GIS map uh, related layers. Uh, we're using estimated water usage from our program and adds more vigor to our program and other utilities are contributing their data as I mentioned as well. So I did this dump of, if you will, a date I visited the site because I know there's been some recent um, data loading and this is the kind of information that we can get and find areas of concentration that the, the hotter the color, if you will, is a way of diving in and looking for water usage in general. And this is another way of looking at it, the hotter the color and you can zoom tightly on, it looks like half, half the service area is using fourth quartile water, which is pretty high and that's not the case. Uh, you have to zoom in and look, but we still, there's a lot of opportunities. Our average use for reclaimed and potable water is about 215 gallons of water per day per household. Um, so that's like a one water number. Our potable water usage is right around 115 or so. So half the water is going on the ground. Um, another way water usage from the standpoint of subdivisions and even premises and get an idea of where we are, how far out on the bell curve, if you will, and how skewed it looks in the sense of uh, water usage. So what I wanna get at with the time that we've got is this grant. And I got really just these two last slides is what we're seeing is, and, and we're, we received this grant is um, 
what we want to do is target the 100 largest or large residential users of water for irrigation using our AMI data. And with H2O say we got a ton of history there. We can get to that pretty quickly. And what we want to do with, with, with that is a retrofit residential customers with smart controllers. And we've talked a lot about that already here and uh, the, the type of technology that's available. Um, we also want to update existing controllers to, at that end of it to um, make, make it more efficient. And what we're aiming for and projecting is about 16 million gallons a year with those 100 users. We are par partnering with Hunter Industries. They're going to pr provide it. And we have $150,000 to spend, which half of it will be Toho and half of it will be with, the, with, uh, with uh, DEP. And I kind of got ahead of myself. So if you look at that opportunity, the cost, and let's say rough numbers at the tier that these folks are at, it's $167 per, per thousand gallons. It looks like it could be a 5.6 year payback. Not real impressive, but it's something to be mindful of. But if you take um, alternative water supply, potable water at as much as 10, probably more than 10 per thousand, that's expensive water that we're going after. It's less than a year. So the economics in the future really kind of get kind of exciting. And what we'd hope to draw from this partnership as, as it, if you will, modest right now is to look at a ways of growing it if we can prove this out. In fact, we think we can exceed that savings. So um, with, again, being respectful of time and sorry about the glitch earlier, uh, stay tuned for further developments. Back to you. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, one question came in, uh, how many people per household are, are figured into the 215 gallons per day on average? I think we're, we're doing, I think 2.5, something in that vicinity, 2.6. Uh, and I actually had a question uh, on the uh, on the program, the grant program that you have. How how much money it, will it be? Will you pay completely 100% for the upgrade to the customer, or do they have to have some skin in the game? Right now, that that this is um, they the customer. I believe has no skin in the game, other than the fact that the, <laughs> they'll reap the savings. Um, it's it's intended to be a demonstration project. Okay. Pr proof of concept. Now we're not proving the technology, the hypothesis that it works, it doesn't work. We're looking at ch changing and see what effect it has on behavior as well and awareness and to use it to tout going forward that this can work. This is what an investment might look like and this might be the payback over time. And we'll be probably refining our messaging and so forth uh, as time goes on and look, probably look for some other partners uh, in addition to Hunter. Okay. A um, comment came in, AMI combined with H2O Save seems to provide incredible data and data analytics opportunities. Have you thought about using gamification to motivate homeowners to achieve targets and goals or to compete with neighborhood averages via an application? Yes, some of that's already in H2O Save. And um, this initiative that uh, that's, we're labeling as customer engagement is something that will, uh, I think, enhance that. Um, Orphans to pay their bill and so forth. They're getting used to it. Our population is a service population. They, um, while being that, they're they're not necessarily technology savvy, maybe as the average, but that is that is rapidly not the case. They're getting used to using their cell phones. So some some of the older folks that are that are out there that are they're, we're being pleasantly surprised, and I think messaging through the smartphone um, appliance, if you will, is the way to go and to, and to challenge the user and make them aware of, of what, what the highs and lows is, are in their neighborhood and, and uh, you know, beat, try to beat it and, and try to find some, some ways of incentiv incentivizing that as well. Um, Deirdre just says, Toho's leading the way, well done. Deidre, Deidre was very instrumental with us with crafting Florida Water Star. Um, she's, we really appreciate her early efforts and her continuing efforts here. And I think it's echoing um, in, a, in a really positive way. Thanks, Deidre. We're just over 2.30, but Adam, I saw you put a clarification in the chat. Did you want to articulate that to clarify that question about uh, two days a week restrictions? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I need to unmute. 
Yeah, I think I want to clarify because one of the comments had to be that they want to argue that, that turf grass shouldn't be used in the urban landscape. And again, I want to push back on that to a great de degree. Um, I think turf grass is fine. I mean, if we were only going to allow plants that didn't need frequent water, we'd never plant any uh, annual flowers in the landscape because those have to be watered extremely frequently in order to survive. So I think we need to be talking about less about the plant and more about how best to manage those plants. And my, my comment really was around the frequency with which we could um, provide a watering event to manage those plants. We can reduce overall water con con consumption in the urban landscape dramatically by opening the water window up a little bit to allow us to take full advantage of ET-based controls. And when you can open a water window, you can, you can truly reap the rewards of that technology. But in a closed down water window, you do not reap the rewards of ET-based management processes. Well, thank you for that clarification. Um, as I said, we'll be putting together a blog post on this and we certainly have a lot of information for that post. We're now at 2.33, so we're actually over time. And uh, I appreciate all the panelists all the panelists spent over two hours here because they's tuned in early and um, probably spent the last two days thinking about this. But anyway, appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate your time. And um, we will see everyone back here next Wednesday. Thank you, Dr. Dukes. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.